Good morning, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Trying to find my pen tool here real quick. Good to see everyone. There's JP. Good morning. There he is. How are you? I'm frustrated. <laughs> it's been a wet, it's been a um, choppy morning. It has been a chop chop. Just, we're just having to be really, really patient. And you know, we preach patience and it never gets easier. No, especially today. Yeah. Um, it's a good it's a good day to talk about something else. Yeah, volumes are super low today too. They are they are super low. I mean I'm, I'm looking at like just in Q volume here is 63,000 contracts below where we should be. Yeah. And What's that's the, uh, that's the, three that's three times the standard deviation. So that if that gives you an idea for how bad that is. Uh ES is 219,000 contracts below where they should be by now. Yeah. <clears throat> Makes sense. And why pray tell? I mean, I know, but why pray tell? Does that make sense? That we're this low? What's going on? I don't think there's anything hanging out there, news-wise, any geopolitical stuff that's really. I don't know. Maybe they've had such a volatile few months here that they just want to take a rest. Not yeah. that January is sort of odd to take a rest right here, but it is what it is. I was just looking at. I mean, just look at the implied volatility has just crashed on the NASDAQ here, just absolutely getting smoked. Um, and for those of you who don't know what implied volatility is, that's a, that's a metric that can predict range, like how wide the range. If you see an expansion of implied volatility, which basically says that the market is anticipating less certainty, uh, people are pricing in risk more and um, expect, and then it typically leads to lot wider ranges, but. But we're, yeah, we're, we've got earnings have started this week, but big bank earnings are next week. It's an inside day. We have no IB extension. Um, the only thing that's really kind of happened is we, you know, we got up here and tested point of control from yesterday, found some sellers, but, and if, if we could take out the IB low, I think there's an opportunity late in the afternoon to switch, but we got to get below that sucker. Um, all right, Frank's looking at Starbucks here. Let's yeah. see. All right, let's look at Starbucks. Not sure if they'll continue. Where's your stop at on that, Frank? Okay. And what, hold on a second, Frank. What it, answer two things for me? Um, what's your time frame on this? Is this hmm. a intraday trade, a swing trade, and then two? Where's your stop at, and why? in your opinion, that'll help us out a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yes, always intraday. Okay, so it's an intraday trade. And what was your entry number? That'll help us out too. I got short at the open, on the open. So we'll assume that the open print is your short. Okay, um, all right. So intraday on the open, let's take a look. What do we got going on here? Covered some at 61.80. All right, let me pull Starbucks up here. Here's a five minute, JP. Okay, very good. Well, I'm biased, but I want Starbucks to go to the moon because my son works here. <laughs> <laughs> and he has stock options on it. Yeah, I'm with you. So, okay, um, so on the open, you shorted looks like 62.80 area, is that right? Um, you covered some at 61 for it looks like a buck, if I'm reading it correctly. Um, came back up, tested the open, and then blew through the open is now, um, 
and now is is consolidating and and finding some some acceptance up above at 6317 area just from a high level view um personally once this went back through the open i would have covered um that that's me okay and the reason i would is i don't want to get you, you already got a little bit off i don't want to get underwater and at this point they tested tested um they auctioned down and tested the low side i don't know what overnight trade was i i don't uh, we'd have to look at that. Um, well, hang on, Josh. Is great. Is great. Your overnight. Yeah, yeah. The highlight. Okay, so here. we actually open. Where did we open here? Did we open at sixty-two? Even sixty-two thirty looks like. Okay, so I had that totally wrong. So we opened, had an open drive. You covered some at sixty-one eighty. So you got some off on sixty-one eighty. Yeah, so it had to be in that open five-minute drive. Okay, so that red candle's part of it as well. Okay, yeah, I got to look that. at this on my chart. So you covered some there. Once it blew back through, uh, okay, so once it went back above 62, which is overnight highs, yeah, I would have definitely, that would have been my stop would have been. I would have been out of that trade personally because I don't want to hold on to this because they can start gapping this thing up at this point. So now if they if they hold it in here, okay, um, through the e afternoon, then we have a risk of okay that high volume node there at sixty was at sixty three seventy area has a chance of getting touched, and then of course there's some high volume above that at about sixty four. Those are magnets right there. Yeah. Um, what does the longer time trend look like on? That? So, and he's so you got you got short at the open, covered some at sixty one eighty, and then uh, out the short when it crossed back through the open. And then he got long when it broke the IB uh, on the IB break, which would have been right around here. And then, uh, and so are you still, you're still long? I thought he's short actually. Well, he was short early and then he got long. Out and the crossed over OPM. Like, okay, yeah. I didn't read that. Got yeah, long. Yeah, so like short, short okay. entry here, covers in this five minute, got long here. Um, All right. Yeah, that's so, great. So yeah, I mean, well, so here's here's the, the other thing. You've you basically you gap. You had a gap open, and you've you've closed the gap. So you have a couple different targets. You have the the five day composite here at sixty three fifty seven. That's the first target, and then the second would be yesterday's point of control. I like the fact that they've migrated the point of control higher. So there's no excess yeah. on this profile. Yeah. Um, if you let's look 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 at it from a. Um, now, the t this is just the TPO, so it's not showing you the volume, which is why we prefer volume to time. But there's just it all, you know, the, the, there's no the skew, it's kind of skewed like this. Um, if you see it kind of go out like that, then that's a more complete auction. Yeah, I, I like, so here's, here's, if I'm in that trade, this is the way I'm managing it. I got a decision to make. Do I want to hold it into the weekend? Because yeah. um, I'm up. Um, if you've not taken any profits up here and you, uh, you may want to take some up here. Um, yeah, you look there, we have uh, some excess to the bottom. looks uh -huh. like we could be forming a nice peak formation there. So yeah, it looks as, so you don't hold over the weekend. Okay. So then you're going to probably need to cover. So if they can't, if they can't, you know, keep closing inside of yesterday's range, watch them come in and, and clean up these single prints down here back to the IB high. Yeah. So, so go back to your five minute. If you so, got in at IB high, that's probably where you got to have your got to be defending this thing. Um, where's the IB high of this one, Josh? It's uh, sixty-two eighty-four. Okay, so let's go back to that five minute here. Let's help them out here. So, so I mean, you're right. You're right. I be, this 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 candle right here. I I would ha I would defend that. You could defend that one, or if you want to get tight with it, it is a Friday. Um, just take yeah. it below the low there, that five yeah. minute there, 63, yeah. 63.10. Just keep it there. The algorithms are probably going to take you out, but at least you've you've captured some, and there's no sweat off the deal. So where yeah. did you put your first long target? Yeah, mine is at yesterday's half back. Um, I would go to the volume area. I wouldn't go yeah. half back. So again, yeah. just me. So yeah, I, I'd say why half back. You know, it's, it's a, it's a rationale. It's not a, I mean, it, like it's look at where the inventory is. That's going to be more powerful than a halfback level, you know, because if you look at 6385, I mean, what's there, there's, there's really nothing there. There's, there's nothing of significance. You got 
I can tell you right now, we get to 63.57 and this thing's going to slow and pause because there were both buyers and sellers there this week. That's, that's what we see when, when we're seeing the build out of the profile like this, you're seeing participants on both sides of the auction that were willing to do business and they're likely willing to do business there again. It's a good trade though. You done, oh. if that's, if those are your scenarios going into the, the morning, I think it's, it's a, you had a great plan. Uh, you really mm -hmm. did. You, you look, you look short on the deal. Okay. It didn't work out on that. Then you turned around, took the IB high. Now you got a good trade going on. Don't, don't, I mean, the IB high is almost to your, well, it is your entry. So yeah, you got to defend it. But at this point, late in the Friday, I wouldn't let some of that profit get away. I just go ahead and tighten everything up and let the market take you out. Now, if it pops into the, into the close, then close it out on the highs and, you know, call it a great, a great trade. Yeah. That's a good question. Thanks. It's a, it's, you know, it's a relevant, it's a relevant um, segue into what we're going to talk about today. So, you know, again, any, anybody else has other questions, feel free to, to bring those, but um, real quick reminder of the risk involved with trading. Hopefully you're, <laughs> if you've been trading at all, you know, you know, there's a risk around that. You need to know those. Um, it's a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm Josh. I'm the founder of Trade Profile and also with me is JP who is, dude, you are the, you are the share to my Bono. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, how about let's use it like the U2. Um, you're the, you're the Holmes to my Sherlock. There you go. That didn't, the first one didn't sound right. The first one didn't sound right. Um, the, so the, the, it's this using the profile to assess auction direction and quality. And it's really kind of, this is the challenge is, okay, so how do you evaluate the quality of a move to know whether to stay with it? or counter it, right? This is a, it's a consistent challenge. It's one that we're, cause we're always making decisions on the hard right edge of the chart. Uh, how do I know to stay with it? How do I know to, mm, I should not, or how do I even take the counter uh, position? Because it's one of the great things about some of these products we can trade, we can trade both ways. Uh, this is part of what we'll be looking at next week in our profile trading development pathway where, uh, we're looking at determining auction direction and quality. And we'll do that while thinking about, and we, and we do this every week, but we think about four behaviors observable in every auction, how to observe them, four questions to ask before you end a trade, and then four stages of auction competency. You know, we're, always, we're always thinking about, can I, can I read the auction and how auctions behave? Then can I build trade ideas around that? And then how proficient am I? Where, where all that overlaps, you find a pretty consistent and profitable trader. and the risk of not being able to, to figure out this direction quality thing is, um, you know, see if this resonates. You're going to struggle to assess and predict the future auction behavior, and you're going to take trades, and it feels like you're going to spend most of the time in uh, drawdown, and you're going to have low positive expectancy. Um, you know, can I, can I get an amen of anybody who's ever put on a trade and feels like that they took on three times the heat for the profit. It, like if the trade actually became profitable, they took three times the heat of what they experienced in profit. Um, or it Amen. was so, it was, yeah, it was so painful while you were in the trade that once it finally got to, to profitability, you took it off. Cause you're just like, Oh, the pain was so bad. Um, one of the dynamics that's in play there is a uh, inability to discern auction direction and quality. So um, here's, the, here's a great principle that can help us is that uh, profile structure, good or poor, provides reference for auction expectation. So either a continuation uh, or reverse. And the ultimate outcome, if you understand this, is that you can discern the direction quality uh, and the likelihood upon which whether they'll continue reverse or rest. And then what ends up happening is you have trades entered that experience less max adverse excursion. So MAE is a, is a metric that we track. If you, if you journal your trades, and we encourage you to journal your trades, um, it's, it's, it, when you go back and look at a trade, there should be more, <clears throat> you know, the, the trade should spend more in the max favorable excursion, meaning the amount of time the trade went in your favor should be wider than the amount it went against you. If, you're, if you find that you're spending more times, it's, it's adverse against you than for you, um, that, that's an opportunity to, to do some development. 
So once you, and you can significantly dial back how much adverse excursion you experience by being able to really answer these two questions. So, um, so next week, our team's going to be looking at auction direction and quality, and we're going to, we'll start everything with these two questions. So um, they are, and you're going to, you're going to think that they're silly, um, but they're very helpful. Uh, two questions we're always trying to answer with respect to the auction is which way is the auction attempting to go? And the second is how good of a job is it doing in getting there? So <clears throat> if you think about, let's just look at um, the S and P E minis here, which finally have, uh, they have IB high extension. So which way is this auction trying to go? Right, we can ask that of any product. We can say, well, which way is this auction trying to go? Um, we could, we can even expand the profile here. So you can see the 30 minute periods. Yeah, it's, it's, it's attempting to go higher. And, and how good of a job is it doing at that? That's the other question. So then, so how you answer that is, okay, what, what uh, criteria could you, could, you, could you add, could you think about that could help qualify auction direction? Um, think about, and I, I often use, um, I often think about, housing markets because i think there's a great correlation between housing markets and how financial markets work but um say housing prices are moving higher okay so we can see oh man that house sold for that's household higher that household higher okay what types of things would you want to see in a housing market to give you confidence like say you were trying to buy a house today and housing prices were going higher what would you want to see in that market that would give you confidence that you're not going to buy the top It's not a rhetorical question. Yeah, you need to see. You would need to see more buyers, and and tell, talk to me about those buyers. Uh, where are they buying? How much are they buying? You know, what are they paying as as they're buying houses? Okay, so <clears throat> a couple things here, and these are these are good. So yeah, the comparables, right? Anytime anybody gets a house assessed, they look at the comparable prices. And, and why, do they, why do we look at comparable prices? Why does, why does that matter? Or what are, we trying to, what are we trying to discern when we think about comparables? The value, absolutely. Like I wanna know if, I, if I'm getting a deal. And at a very, very basic, yeah, you know, very basic, you know, way to see value is this, or, or to see if I got a deal is, am I buying at or below value or am I selling above value, right? We want to sell, we want to sell above value. We want to buy at, you know, or I want to sell at or above value. I want to buy at or below value. Um, I get in trouble if I buy above value and I get in trouble if I sell below value. Right, so who think think behaviorally? What type of people buy above value, and what type of people sell below value? Emotional, absolutely, yeah. So that that the the. the the, the emotional person, the person who's scared of missing out, right? This, this is a person who, is, who thinks it's going to run away from them and they're not going to get an opportunity. So they're impatient, they're impulsive, and, and they, they are the one that will buy the highs and sell the lows, okay? So when we don't want to be that person. We don't want to be the person. So to, to do that, you know, we think, all right, just like you guys have said really well here, you know, what, what would I want to see if I want to see prices going higher, I want to see that higher prices continue to bring more volume to the upside. Like I want to see that there's other people willing to do business. If I see 
the inventory and the amount of transactions dying off as I go higher in higher prices, what would that tell you? Like if I, you know, like if say we were able at, you know, if you look at a median uh, housing price in a neighborhood, say that median house price is 400 K. Okay. So, um, and say I did a thousand units in a neighborhood at 400 K and then I go to 475 and I do 500 and then I go to 525 and I do 250 and I do 575 and I do 75 transactions. What's what? Yeah, you're, you're running out of willing, willing buyers. So that's telling you that your market's overpriced. And, and when that, if, as you're running out of willing buyers at those higher prices, what's going to have to change, what's going to have to happen for that market to continue going higher? There's a couple, there's a couple different scenarios that can, that can occur for that auction to keep going higher. Yeah. And one of them, you're absolutely right. One of them is we come back to a place where there was value before to find more buyers, or we could kind of hold prices and build out uh, acceptance of those higher prices, which would then, sh you know, turn the shape of that, that auction. So the, uh, the example that uh, Frank put out here on um, Starbucks is a pretty good one. So, so notice, notice that there, and this is what, what the profile is letting you see is it's letting you see graphically what, you know, how these be behaviors are at play, which is why, you know, we always talk about, we're not technicians, we're not fundamentalists, we're behaviorists because the behavior will tell you what you need to know. And Early on in the day, you could see there was a build out of volume right around 62, 42 area. And now you can see that the highest volume is up here. So as the days progressed in this auction, you know, we, we, we traded higher and we've stalled. And the reason that we stalled is we needed additional participants who are willing to do business at these higher prices to give us the energy to, you know, push on to the next level. Yeah, because because you have volume is building. So when you see volume building and accumulating at the top of your range in your market, that's a good indication that there's probably you haven't yet seen the person who is buying and and just completely caught out there. Now there were early on in the day, right? So when when we first made this move, this profile didn't look like this, and you know there were people up here that were like, "Who? Um, if they were buying up here, they they were sweating for a little bit." And they needed to see these prices hold, meaning that there were other people willing to do business up here to be able to have the confidence to stay in the trade. And as long as they continue to hold these prices, then that's good expectation that will continue higher, which is why JP and I were talking about, hey, let's, let's guard, guard this area because if, if we get below that, then you know, they could roll back to a prior area of acceptance. Okay, so... The, we're, we're, you're seeing the same thing. So like when you look at the ES here, okay, different scenario. Notice where the point of control is. And notice that as we're moving higher, what's happening? We're running out of volume at, at these higher prices. We had a big area of volume down here and they're pushing higher, but we're running out of volume. So yeah, you could buy up here, but the question is, you know, what do you, what, and this is, this goes to our four questions that we ask every time we put on a trade is okay well what's the opportunity where's the target that's interested that, you know what's the rationale for where you think this price will go and what would tell you that you're wrong and what would have to happen as, as you were in this trade to confirm that you were in the right direction and i can tell you you know what needs to happen well given the fact that all the volume is down here i would have to see this auction continue to hold and build out the transaction so that you would start to see a shift in what this profile looks like where you're actually starting to see more movement this way otherwise there's the higher risk that this person up here is is caught out emotional and they bought the high uh would i buy buy ib breakouts um in in very seldom situations yes and the that's typically because they're what, what's going on there is if you have a really, what we call a tight initial balance. So um, we, we measure how wide statistically 
uh, this range is relative to a about a monthly average and then you know if it's if it's narrower than average then we would um, look potentially to be more active on the breakout uh, today was one of those days actually um, but there's other dynamics at play that make that less attractive one uh, you're completely inside of yesterday's range and uh, and the breakout to the upside um, you're you're basically going right into a high volume area um, so it just wasn't it just wasn't as attractive and three it's friday and, and three it's friday ladies. and it's yeah and you're going into <laughs> one it. yeah it just it just ain't worth it um yeah but yeah these are the these are the two questions and you just think through it think through it use that housing market example to say okay what would i want to see in a housing market to buy to, to buy in and feel okay about, you know, being in this thing. And then, you know, the question is like, when's it time to sell? You know, well, when, when it's time to sell is when, you know, higher prices aren't bringing in, um, aren't being, aren't bringing in more participants. And then, uh, you know, I'm starting to see, you know, some sellers coming in now, like here I'm expanding the profile out a little bit to look at it on a, you know, this is each of those 30 minutes with a five minute period inside. And you can see like right now, we're actually trying to build about, build volume out at the top of this. So that could suggest we'll move higher, but there are some sellers coming in here. And you know, if I, what I start looking for up here is I like, like start seeing these first aggressive sellers, you know, with some volume, which we don't have any yet. Um, we had some aggressive sellers earlier, uh, but they just could not get any follow through. You know, here was some aggressive sellers. They just couldn't get anything to go with them. Here were some aggressive sellers, couldn't get anything to go with them, um, but they were also right in the middle of value. But when you're, when you're out at the extreme, you, I mean, you're starting to see the inventory fail, that's a good clue that, hey, I want to protect this position if I'm long. Now, just like you talked about earlier, like, okay, well, if, uh, you know, where's a place that you want to buy if you see price going higher, you can use that in mentality to think about, okay, where might I target if I get short? So we have basically the comparable or the value of the day is 2583. So if you know if the auction fails higher, we've got a pretty cool target to trade back to where we know we could find some buyers. Um, so that becomes a, a, a good target to, to go back toward if it wasn't Friday. So that's that's kind of a light overview. We're gonna dig in a lot more of that next week. Um, but that's the uh, the genesis of where we'll be talking about how do you discern that, you know, what are, what are different metrics and, and things that you, you know, I think there's 15 different things that we look at that add some more granularity and more confirmation to that, but that's kind of a high level. So hope that helps. And then, you know, we're just going to look here at the rest of the markets. If y'all have any additional questions, anything that we can uh, help with, or you want to have us take a look at a market, we're happy to do that. Um, but it is, this whole Just any other questions, general questions too. So yeah, this whole market is just really uninteresting. Cattle making fresh weekly highs into Friday. Well, you were expecting that to break down, weren't you? Well, no. What I was looking for, I was expecting it to go higher yeah. because because here was here was the move, right? And um. So like this was the first, the first bit of buying. I mean, actually, it started back back here. We we actually came into a, a high volume area. So let me, let me actually let me show you this. This is actually kind of pretty cool. Yeah, Ivan, you can absolutely ask a question. So the auction attempted, it got back above this high volume level from, this is multiple sessions, um, and then pressed to the monthly highs, building out volume. But see how there's no, there's no uh, low volume to the upside? So we haven't really, tr you know, got anybody too long in this auction. So as long as they continue to hold this area, uh, you know, the path of least resistance is to the upside. What I'm looking for is I'm looking for the auction to try to go higher from here and then fail. 
So that would be next week trade, like get them up here somewhere. And then I've got a pretty cool target initially that we could, you know, target back to. And then if that breaks, then we could be heading back lower. Whole model of higher high, higher low to expect a new high after a pullback. Yeah, and it, especially in a, in a, so we call that, um, so I mean, we would call that a price continuation pullback. So what that is, and, that, and that's a that's a valid way. Um, where did my questions go? That's a valid way to 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 trigger into a trade. Um, I mean, you could even actually even use it here in this example with with cattle. Okay, you have your initial balance, um, and then you see we start one time framing higher here. You know, so you could use in into the next period, you could say, okay, I'm assuming that the one time framing is going higher. So I can use pullbacks like on a five minute, as long as I don't make a lower low to get in for the continuation higher. If that, if that was the expectation. So looking at, looking at ES, I mean, si similar thing. The, the, the other thing that we look at on that are, um, Areas like w once you could get in market trending, which it looks like you know we're, we got a little bit of trending going on here, is um, you know where are some significant and decent order flow spikes. So there's one actually right here where we had some buyers and some volume. Um, so pullbacks to this level that don't violate it could be opportunities to get get long, and you kind of follow that higher high, higher low. Now this is looking at five minute, not ten minute, but. Same thing would hold true because the auction auction is consistent across all time frames. One thing I want to sort of mention is like today. Um, it, it first, if you if you don't have a trade plan or any type of methodology, um, here's typically what's going to happen: you're going to come into a day like today where it, this is a tough day to trade. It's not easy. Okay, just a lot of back and forth. We've crossed multiple prices or pricing uh, multiple times. And what I mean by that is we've gone across, just pull up a five minute chart of the, oh, the NASDAQ. <clears throat> so you, you can see here, we've just been ping ponging back and forth. We've crossed the 6589 you know, price, I don't know how many times today, just back and forth and back and forth, just really just chop and slop and there's nothing in there. When individuals, and we got to think about the, like Josh had mentioned, we are behaviors or we, we measure behavior of other individuals. So when you look at that, what are, what are people thinking? And they're getting chopped up. They're like, okay, I need to make money today. It's Friday. I've had a loss this week and I'm going to try to force something. And when that doesn't work, most people's mentality is I need to find something different. This isn't working. Mm -hmm. And, and what I, I would in, implore you to do is instead of looking at it that way, why don't you look at this as, okay, this is telling me that it's not a data trade. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be, and this is, this is the hard one. There is going to be days where you don't trade. Mm -hmm. That's um, the best trade. Yeah, that is the best trade. Now, if you are feeling you must, must take a trade, I'm going to, again, I'm going to implore you to step back and think about your trading career. Mm -hmm. Because the idea of trading is, and I'm gonna, we got to be real with you, okay? We want to show you the right way, and, and it is possible. You can, you can do well in this world in trading. But you also have to, you know, temper that with um, realism. The realism here is that, you know, you may not get a trade. You know, there's no trade today, or at least for me. Um, there's just nothing there. Um, we'll wait for a better day where, as we say um, uh, in the slat, and the channel is that when the bag of the money is, the, the bag of money is sitting in the corner, we'll go pick it up. There's no bag in the corner today. It's, it's definitely not there. So we... Um, Again, just use that as a as a as a guide for you that when you see stuff like this, there's no trades, and if you don't have a trade plan or some type of trade approach that you can rely on on a regular basis, then I will again get one, okay? Because when you th then when you get into a day like this, you're like, okay, nothing is setting up for me, so I guess it's sit on my hands Friday type of situation, and it's going to be an early Friday for me, and that's what. Well, you know, that's 
I, I guess it's the benefit of trading. And unfortunately, the downside to it is you didn't make money today. And guess what? You'll be do just fine. There's lots of days left in the year. So, yeah, we. That's a good word. We, we, I mean, we're always trying to stack probabilities in and have multiple layers of confirmation when you trade. I mean, just one of the things to just look at today. I mean, you're, we, we have not yet traded outside of yesterday's value. Um, and we've had, here was an impulsive attempt to the downside fails. Here's an impulsive attempt to the upside fails. Here's an impulsive attempt to the downside fails. Here's an attempt to the upside fails. Here's an attempt to the downside fails. Here's an attempt to the upside. There's, you know, still not getting follow through. Um, and even if they do, we're still inside of yesterday's value. So this is, that's a, that's a hard, that's just a really, really hard place because, you know, somebody's trying to, trying to push this thing, but the inability to even escape the range of the first hour tells you that there's just there's just not a big enough trader to go with um and control is really really wonky and we we just wrapped up this last week talking about time frame like you know there are better periods to trade and so yeah there there may be an opportunity this afternoon but it's it's not a high probability setup because we're already at significantly low volume for the last month and on top of that we're going into Friday. So, I mean, we, we could just, you could, I mean, is it possible we just drift higher the rest of the day? Sure. Um, and all it takes with the low volume situation is like one trader comes in in a five minute and just wipes you out completely. Um, so it's, it's tough. And, it, uh, and that's never happened before. Oh, that's never happened. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. That's happened and, so much. You know, so and from a trade and what you know what a trade plan does is it's it's creating scenarios of which is creating scenarios of of expected behavior based on an understanding of how auctions work. So that's why those four behaviors are so important. So I do know, I mean, one of the things I do know is that there's a move coming in this market, and I know that because uh, we actually had. Let's go out and look. All right, let's just kind of talk about where we've been. Um, there was a move and then there was rest. There was an auction kind of going sideways for a couple weeks. And then from the middle of that comes another move. Uh, yesterday made a lower low, um, shut off the upside auction. So now we're in rest phase again. And you can actually see that the, the value area, the, you know, this big, see this big high volume node here. So um, we're accepting value and building value for the next move. Now, I don't know, JP doesn't know, and none of you know where that next move is going to be. And if you, if you say, oh, yeah, I know what it is, you don't. Um, that's kind of the first clue to me that, that somebody's not a consistently profitable trader is because they're like, oh, yeah, it's going to do this next. You don't. Um, we know a move is coming. That you can, I think you can say that with confidence because the auction is right now resting and it's getting ready for the next move. It's waiting for that, that bigger trader. And that's how, that's how market, you understand that's how markets move is you have a bigger trader who's distributing capital across the market that causes a market to move. When you see a market just going sideways, the big guy's not there. So everybody's just fighting over themselves looking for table scraps and it gets really hard to trade and you, you know, you get a start and then you get stopped out and you get a start. And it's just, it's just really, really, um, really, really difficult. So, um, what you know, and so now we're looking for the behavior that would say, you know, okay, where are we going to go out of this? We know the next behavior is either another directional move or some type of test. And a test is where you, it looks like a move and then it fails. So you know, like if we break out up into this area um, next week and then and return back, I would call that a, a failed test higher. Um, or we could, you know, we could trade, you know, up to this and, and accept these prices and keep moving higher or we could just trade lower. Those are all, those are all scenarios and those are all part of what's in a trade plan. So you're, you're building those out. We just know, hey, we've had the move, now we're in rest. The next two behaviors is either gonna be another directional move or some type of test, and we don't know which one that's gonna be, so we gotta wait and see for that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an informed, you know, a hypothesis is an educated guess, 
based on consistent predictable behavior, but it still needs to be confirmed. So you're right, Frank, it is, it is, a, it is a hypothesis. Um, there's, there's nothing in, in trading that is certain aside from the risk that you can control. Um, all right, so see Ken's, Ken's questions. Do you, do you ever buy straddles when locked sideways like that? Um, I don't, I don't buy straddles. That, that is a, that is a, so for those of you who don't have a lot of exposure with options, um, so what, what you could do is you could buy an at the money call and an at the money put, cause you know, some type of move is coming. How this trade works is that if you have a big move away from an area like this, um, if it moves enough, it needs to move pretty good, but if it moves enough, uh, one option will be in profit, the other one will not, but the one that will be in profit will accelerate faster than the one that's not. And so that's actually a, a pretty good low risk way to try to catch a break. Um, so that that is, I, I don't personally do those, but that is a that is a pretty good, like if you see a balancing area like that, that is a potential strategy you could explore, yeah. Otherwise you can just wait if you want to use the regular contracts or if you're, you know, let's say it's an equity, just wait for the break and the first pause, pull back um, and just make sure it's real, you know, because sometimes they can do false breaks and then pull it right back into range. And, and that's when they get people stuck and the algorithms are starting to play games a little bit. So mm -hmm. sometimes it's, it's good. I mean, if it's a big move, it's going to be a big move. You have plenty of time to capture some profits in there. Yeah. Yeah. So how, how I would look at that is I, I know I have a really, Defined value area here, so I, I'm gonna, there, the next move is likely going to come from this area right in here, and it's going to go with volume. So you know, watch that move. If, say if it's to the high, if it's higher, um, then you know pullbacks to this area will get bought. And if if I get back below this, then I'm wrong, and then everybody who tried to buy this is also wrong. You know, I just thought of something. Somebody told me, and this is sort of a funny story. Somebody told me, you know, what, this was many years ago. They said, hey, you know, if you're struggling, right, just do the opposite of what you're struggling with and you'll make money. And I thought about that and I'm like, you know how tough that is to do? Oh, yeah. Because then you're always second guessing yourself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know something triggered that thought in my mind. So does anybody have any other questions, comments? I mean, just... I mean, give us something, throw something out there. We'd love to answer it for you. Don't be shy. There's no dumb questions. And if you think it's a mistake you're worried about that you made and you're embarrassed about it, we'll get in line because we've all done them, brother or sister. Um, or worse. Or worse, yes. There's some stories I can tell you. Um, so anyway, yeah, just throw it out there. Let's get it in the open. It's therapy session, so... <laughs> As a quiet bunch, man. We could we could talk about the day that I lost 100k in one day. You could do that. Uh, we could talk about my big loss too. That was a fun one. On a Friday afternoon. Now ask me why I don't trade after 12 <laughs> noon anymore. That was one of those nose cleaners that you don't come out of the office go okay well I won't do that again. It was one of those nose cleaners like oh crap what did yeah. I just do you know. Uh. -uh. Yeah, window trader. You got a question for you? Yeah. Go ahead. How's the volume look look on when, when it's drying up? So here's here's what's one of the things that I love about this product. Um, and uh, Terry Lieberman, who is the the founder of Window Trader, you know, like first things he always talks about when you use Window Trader is it mess with the colors. So I'm gonna just give you an example. Um, like here's here's Toss, right? They've got they've got volume profile, um, but it I can kind of see where volume intensity is by the shape of the profile but it's all one color, right? So um, when, I, when I look here, I can actually go in and I can set, like I can look at the profile and um, I can set um, down here on the TPOs, so this is time price opportunity. So I can say, okay, high volume percentage. So the, give me, so sh the top 30% of volume at price, I want it to be this, you know, fire engine red and the, the next 40% of volume, I want it to be this magenta, and then everything else, so that that'd be the last 30% um, 
a volume would be white. So that so I could very easily see the lower volume areas. I can actually tweak this and I could say, all right, well just show me um, the top 60%. So that would show me the bottom 40%. I could even make it even in, even tighter and I could say, all right, I actually don't, I want this next. So then I can really quickly visually see where all of the high volume areas are, um, which is, it, it just helps your decision making. You, I mean, you're, you, you can say, okay, well, I know where there's no participation and I know where there's higher participation, which is, which is really helpful. And you can tweak those and tweak those colors even here on the Globex, I can have a different color for the profile for Globex. So I can clearly just really quickly see, well, how did Globex trade versus, you know, what's that profile look like versus the uh, intraday? And, um, and then the ability to turn the stuff off that I'm not, that I don't need to look at. So if I say, okay, I'm, I've seen what I need to see in the overnight, I can just turn that off. You know, or, or like I often do is I'll have these decision areas and then you know I'll look at the profile. And then once I get into that, then I'll turn on the smaller time frame to see if there's anything that I want to do, if there's any kind of trigger around that area, um, which is which is pretty cool. So yeah, it it looks in terms of drying up, it looks as low volume. So you know, and you can color it. Some some people actually invert the colors. They're like, I want to, I only want to participate in the low volume areas. So they can you can actually invert the colors to highlight only the low volume areas. Um, and and not the high volume areas. But then also here on the histogram, you can see that it's it's tailing off. So this is a histogram of volume at price. The other way is contract volume. Okay, so this is showing me the number of contracts traded at every price. Obviously, it's drying up down here. There was only 59 contracts. There were only 65 up here. You know, but there's like 8,300 in the middle. Um, so that's that's how that how that looks um view on crude yeah we had a couple on crude yeah. um so what does uh look okay so good deal your view on crude can you look at crude i've got one on window trader okay so yeah let's look at crude let's look at crude so um here here was my let, actually pull up my plan for today so you can just kind of when we talk about trade plan um this is this is what my plan looks like um, actually, I'll show you in a different spot. Um, so, you know, every morning to our team, we post. This is kind of a worksheet that I have that um, all of this is relevant to me in making decisions, but this, this is relevant to what we talked about with these two questions, right? So I start with, at the end of the day, I start asking what, what direction was the auction attempting to go and how good of a job was it doing? You know, what was the open type? What was the day type? What, where was the value area? Where did we do range extension? What was the, uh, the delta between the bid and the ask? And then where were we relative to key composite levels? Where was yesterday's range relative to its average? What was the volume? So you can see that er, er, the auction was attempting higher. Um, we're above all of the uh, significant composite levels. Volume was good. Range was wide. Um, we started with a pretty non-directional open type, and then we trended higher. So, you know, everything looks good on this auction. The only thing that looks wonky is the fact that we went higher with um, sellers. So when you looked at each price, you know, who was winning each price, the sellers were actually winning the price. So this means that sellers are st stepping into the auction as we're moving higher. Um, and so then like things I was looking for today, um, you know, we, we talk about something called a posture. So that kind of sets some context. And then there were, you know, it was to the upside, unless, you know, we started to violate some of these levels. Also noticing that implied volatility is contracting. So that means that the expect expected range for, for today relative to the past is, has been steadily, um, steadily shrinking. Um, so today, you know, I was, I was watching this 42, 52, 26 zone, um, the weekly volume point of control is lower. So, you know, we're trading above a couple different things where I, I was actually looking for um, sideways trade to try to pull value higher. And what I mean by that is you can see that the near term value area, there's a, there's a, a large node here. Okay. And you can see, we've got a couple nodes up here, but they're not as big. So, you know, this is multi-session for, for this, you know, crude's been moving higher. Well, for crude to keep moving higher, 
we got to queue up energy to, to move higher. We got to accept these higher prices. We got to build out volume here and we're, we're do, we're trying. Um, but what I'd like to see is I'd like to see this composite level migrate higher. And to do that, we have to trade sideways. So guess what we're doing today? We're trading sideways and we're trading sideways around these, these larger volume areas to attempt to pull this higher. And so, um, you know, this 5226 area, we, t we touched it early, couldn't get above it um, after we took out the IV high. And so that, that, that was really kind of the, there was a little bit of a responsive trade there, uh, but still inside of yesterday's range um, early on. Now we did attempt lower, which that was the move lower to try to find more buyers, which they found. And, uh, and we, you know, continue to hold these areas. So, I mean, really, unless, unless we could get below $51, uh, the path of least resistance is to the upside. And, and we've got, you know, last month high and uh, some other decision levels up here. We also have some untested Globex. You know, we pushed higher uh, in Globex yesterday. If we could get below 51, then what I would use in this, this would be next week, um, I would look at this area as an area to, to sell into um, and looking for a target back to this area. So, and, and, and the reason for that is, you know, if, again, if you have an auction, so like use the housing market, you know, deal. Um, so this is the comps. These are the most recent comps. Uh, if, if we try to get above this and can't, and we come back to where these comps are, well, what, what did the auction just learn? It just learned they can't go there. So what ends up happening is the, the auction participants get a little more confident that they can then get a better deal. And so then it's like, well, where's the next place that I could go to get a better deal? And that would be this price. So then it, you know, that's why it's like, as long as I can stay below this area, then uh, I'm gonna look for you know, the auction to work its way over a couple sessions to back that way. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty, pretty light overview. I mean, you know, what, how, how we, and we have trade setups that we use. Um, so the, you know, all that I outlined for you is kind of the overlying narrative. And then, you know, as you see that, that narrative play out or not play out, then you have trade setups that you look to exploit, um, within that. Yeah, he's, uh, John's got a great question. That's a, that's a, that's a good, good point, John. So do we, um, do we incorporate the Globex profile into the round term or the RTH considerations? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we look at um, we look at overnight globex session and see you know where are we net long or net short? Do we have you know are we going to have a huge gap? Of course. Do we have some singles that we could clean up? Um, you know, are we trading on the overnight lows, the overnight highs? There's lots of different considerations we take into a, um, into effect bef before the open, and it helps us sort of shape our bias for that day. Yeah, quick quick one I'll say about that. Uh, just uh, to add is um, so how a day like if you go back and you look at closed data and you say okay I want to look at the last you know well I always use kind of a running five year or thousand trading sessions <coughs> um, if I look at day to day closes so if I closed higher than the prior day what's the probability that I will then again close higher the next day and um, you may be surprised to find out that there's absolutely no correlation between a day closing higher than a prior day leading to a higher close the next day. There, there, it's, it's not nothing more than a 50 50. So there's no edge there. Um, however, if like today, when I had higher prices in Globex in crude, there actually, it actually does tip the scales in favor of the buyers um, to suggest that we could get a higher close today. Now, I don't, I mean, how we're behaving right now, unless somebody just stamps on it, uh, the fact that we couldn't get above 52.22 says, you know, we're not going to honor that stat today. But but even when I say there's edge, it's like a 65%. So it's a little it's a little bit north of, of 50, 50, 50, um, but it's not like, you know, 97% probability. 
I mean, there's, but there are, there are behaviors in the auction where there is a 97% probability. Like, um, will we extend the initial balance or will we not? Um, will we take or test out one of the Globex extremes? So if you find that you open, for example, inside of the Globex range, there is a 97% chance you will take out either the overnight high or the overnight low. If you're trading inside of the first hour of the trade, there's a 97% chance you will trade outside of that the first hour high or the first hour low. So that's what we talk about using behavioral statistics in edge. Um, and that's how you can use Globex as well. Great question. Yeah. Yeah. You, and I, you, you talked about this too, JP, like shape, shape of the Globex profile, you know, like and, and gap and how big of a gap it is. Um, there's stats on that. Like, is it is inventory net short, net long, um, is also something that we we take into consideration. Um, so yeah, we do we do look at that um, quite a bit. Any other questions, comments, plans for the weekend? Oh, here's, here's one um, on uh, on Window Trader. So the the data feed. So yeah, Window Trader is the software. The data comes separate from that. And right now there are two different data uh, feeds that you can use for Window Trader. One of them is Bar Chart and the other one is DTN IQ Feed. Um, I use IQ Feed. It also powers um, IRT by Linsoft. Um, I can tell you that they're, they're pretty pricey. So, um, I mean, well, they're, you know, all, all together, you're looking at like, uh, and I tend to think of it in terms of, of uh, points and moves. You're looking at like, uh, you got to capture 12 ticks in the bonds each month to cover it. Um, but I know, I do know that there are, there is a coming data provider for uh, Window Trader that is going to significantly reduce the data fees for non-professional subscribers. And um, so that, that will be significant. Uh, for stocks, it, it, it's same thing. DTN covers, yeah, you have similar feeds. Yeah, bar chart or DTN. So those are the, those are the data feeds that, uh, as of yet, they don't. So some, some platforms allow you to use brokerage data. Um, this, is, this is not one of them. You have to go to an external feed. I mean, truth be told, they get better data that way. But because um, what, what, and what I mean by better data, so there are, there's, there's what's called tick data or one minute data. So, for example, like like Thinkorswim, um, when it when it presents information in terms of volume, uh, even looking at the volume profile and such, it's it's averaging. Uh, it's using one minute bars to 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 build all of that. It's not tick by tick. It's not granular. And um, now, I mean, can you still get it done with that? Absolutely. But um, it. Uh, Every once in a while, you, you find that the, the POCs are off, and um, because they basically smooth the prices over one minute rather than uh, giving you the accurate number. Um, about stocks, same feeds. Yeah, the, the yeah. same feeds will provide you know, all equities, futures, commodities. I mean, it was, there may be some feeds yeah. out there that I'm not aware of that doesn't. But. I mean, we could, we could look at, we were looking at Starbucks earlier, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I have DX feed for another product that wouldn't work then. Yeah, it wouldn't. Let's see, which template do I want to use? Yeah, I, I, I saw that alert. You should be out of Starbucks. This, yeah, see how they broke from that high volume area? Yeah, not a bad trade. Just, you know, you didn't get what you want out of it. Some trades aren't going to work that way. So, they're going to clean up those singles. Call it good. You had a winning day, hopefully, and uh, we'll get back after it on Monday. Today's profile here. Uh, 
So most most likely what's going to end up happening is they're going to get clean up these. Now there is a poor high up here. So I mean, I, I still think there's an opportunity back up into this composite area. And this this is what I you know like this is what I would call um you know, we talked about a a test. Okay, so let's let's look at the last that this balancing area. So moves moves begin from balance as it did. Let me turn off the globex because that's not we don't need that on the stock side. Moves begin from balance, um, and then what happened is we we attempt away from balance. And then come back to that. All right. So um, this auction has told everybody that it couldn't go lower. So now, you know, especially if they can get closes above 63.60, the path to the upside is uh, is pretty good. I do like, you know, I might I might buy back here 62.40, risk to 62.25, you know, looking for 63.60 and higher into next week. This is a cool new feature in Window Trader. It just automatically plots um, prior week high and low and the monthly high and low. So that kind of gives you a, a perspective of where you're at. Where are we doing? We are just not going anywhere. Yeah, slow day. So it's best, I mean, it's a good day to get a lot of good questions out of the way, study, I mean, just, um, you know, if you're studying, this is a good day to do it. Anything to keep your mind away from clicking the button into a trade. I mean, it's 12.30 Eastern Standard Time. It's lunch. There's no volume. There probably will be one more move into the close, uh, but that's a coin flip in my opinion. But um, yeah. Frank, where are you from? Are you in the US or where are you at? Just curious. Oh, you're in New York City. Okay, cool. Anything else, guys, on question wise? Are you actually are you, oh Long Island? Long Island. You're, yeah. you're in one of the boroughs. You're good. The boroughs. Long Island. Out on the island. <laughs> Well, here's here's what I'd encourage you to take it next, um, man. Whenever you're whenever you're in a trade, just whatever product you're looking at, just say, hey, which way is this auction attempting to go? How good of a job is it doing in getting there? And and think through behaviorally. Hey, here's kind of my checklist of if okay, auction's trying to go higher. All right, what would I want to be seeing? You know, um, to the question. I think Ivan had a question uh, earlier about um, higher highs, higher lows. Um, I mean, that, that could be part of your checklist. Hey, if, if the auction is going to go higher, then we're going to get higher highs and higher lows, higher highs and higher lows. That's a, that's a great metric to look at uh, you know, just as part of your checklist of which way the auction is attempting to go. And that, that again, that can work on a shorter time frame. It can also look on a day-to-day. -day. You know, are we making higher highs, higher lows? Um, and then, uh, yeah, do we use tick analysis in your decision making or any other breath indicators? Nope. <laughs> I do. I will say I do. There's a I couple do. I do use. I use breath, breath at, um, and um, that's on a longer time frame basis. And I do I trade off of it? No. Um, but it's just one thing that I do keep an eye on. Um, I do look at, at advancers and decliners and weigh them against delta. Um, but delta is my main go to. So. Yeah, and this is, uh, I know, I mean, Pete Rezinchek does these a lot, um, which, you know, I, I, I think they're effective and can be, especially if you're trading equities. I mean, there's just not correlations for these if you're looking at non-equity products. But if you're looking at equity products, there is, I think there's some rationale around that. Um, and you see, I have this set up here where I can kind of see all, where all the indexes are. I can see the breadth on the NASDAQ. That's the primary equity index product that I trade. You know, what's the fix of the NASDAQ doing? Um, so here's your AD line. Here's your breadth. And then uh, a trend is, is a combination between the breadth and the advanced decline line. Um, and then, you know, and then the tick. 
on the on the cues. Yeah, I just, but I I I just found this too much to look. For me personally, I find it's too much to look at, and I I I lean more on uh, cumulative delta, which is the the order flow. So like, what's actually happening in the product that I'm looking at? So when you look at like tick and and you know breath indicators, that's looking across a bunch of different products, trying to get kind of an overall perspective of where it might go. You'll get divergences in that because you'll look you'll go, oh man, I got a really strong AD line, but why is why is the index going lower or why is, you know, why is there some divergence in that when it should be going higher? And, you know, a lot of that's because it's in some sense a derivative indicator. Whereas the cumulative Delta or the order flow is like, that's that like right now, I mean, you can see that there's some buyers stepping in here. Um, pretty, you know, pretty good uh, buying intensity. Uh, that's what's happening in this product. Like that's not derivative. That's not coming from somewhere else. That's like this product. Yeah, that's and that's built into Window Trader. Yeah, and it's good. And and Delta is is the well, it's not a lagging indicator, uh, yeah. so to speak. But with breadth, again, it, higher time frames, it it's it sets up caution areas for me. Okay, me personally and my plan. So when breadth gets ex way extended, I'm cautious to the upside at that point. That's all that says for me. Again, I don't trade off of that. It's just as a, mm, let's just see where breadth is at this point. Are, is people getting, remember we talked about that at the very beginning. What does it take for the auction to go higher? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, when, when breadth is maxed out, that tells me that, boy, it's going to take a lot to get this thing going. And I don't know if I want to be buying up here at this point. So, and that's just, uh, that's part of my plan. So, yep. That's a great question. There's a lot of, I mean, man, there's a lot of stuff you can look at in the world. I mean, you could fill your charts. You could have 24 screens up. I prefer you have one max two um, and do your, your long-term analysis in the morning and then drop down to your main screen that you're going to look at um, and then, you know, call it good. Keep it simple, man. Just, just really, please keep it simple. Otherwise you're going to drive yourself into the ground. So. And you know why people, I guess this is a great question. Anybody can answer this. It's not rhetorical. So why do people keep adding indicators to the charts? It's a quiz, so you get graded on it. <laughs> <laughs> Bueller? Bueller? Um Nobody? Really? I thought somebody, I thought we'd have five or six people be able to answer that. They don't know what they're to follow. Well, that Frank, you're absolutely correct. That's one. The other one is they think that if they add another indicator, they'll have a better, it'll be a yeah, clearer picture go. to them. Joel's the whole got thing, it. Bingo. If I get the right mix of indicators, I will never lose. Exactly. And here's the thing. I could put one thing on your chart, and if you learn how to trade that, you would still have, you Pro, if you, I don't care how many indicators you have, right? You're going to still trade almost, well, you're going to trade as good, if not better, with just one thing on your chart. Now, I have a couple things on my chart. Now, I'd use that because I know how to use them. Yeah, but if you keep adding stuff after stuff after stuff, um, yeah, it becomes analysis uh, paralysis. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is a real thing. It's crazy. So, you know, just keep it clean. Keep your charts clean. Matter of fact, this weekend, here's a, here's a challenge for you guys. And maybe next week, if you guys are come back on the call, you can let us know how it went. Um, this weekend, just open up a new chart in your platform. Everybody should be able to do that. Put price up there. And if you have profile, put it up there. Just put it up there. Okay. And just look at the profile. Now, if you don't have a profile or you, maybe you just have a volume profile similar to what Josh has up there. Um, just put a volume profile and put your candlesticks up there and, and maybe just one EMA, like a 21 minute EMA and just tell, look at it and keep it clean and, and compare that to your charts that you currently have and ask yourself which one's easier to read. I think you'll be shocked at what you can see. In other words, there's times where I just go and get what they call a naked chart just because I want to see you know, I can see different things when I get a naked chart sometime. And sometimes I need to clear my head. I'll just grab a naked chart and go. And then sometimes I'll only pull one. Um, I use a weekly profile with two hour candles. That's my big time go-to. Um, sometimes I'll just pull up a daily 
uh, profile with 30 minute candles and that's all I'll look at, nothing else. And maybe the composites, of course I always use a composite. Yeah, this, so, is, this is JP's two hour, uh, I've, I've added, I've added over links. This basically shows two hour candles, just the RTH session with a weekly profile is the green and then the purple or the magenta, that's a monthly profile. So it allows me to see, you know, full composite and then it allows me to see, you know, where's the week, what's that look like? And then how is that shaping up for the month? And then where was the prior month? Which I mean, I can tell you right now, looking at this, um, I think, I think a move to 2650 is in the cards. Yeah, absolutely. And then that may, they may, may start that move into the close today. That, that just makes sense. Yeah. I won't be on that bus. I will tell you, <laughs> I'll be outside enjoying the weather. Um, but yeah, as long as, they, as long as they can hold this, it's kind of like, kind of like that Starbucks trade that we were talking about. Yeah. Like, you know, there's no access to the upside. We've got a clear composite level above us. As long as they can hold here, um, you know, there's really nothing stopping us getting up to that direction. No. And you're right, Frank. It's, uh, it, it has, it improves quickly because it makes the picture clear and you don't have a lot of crap on there. Mm -hmm. um, can you comment on NASDAQ this last Wednesday about the IB extension setup you talked about last week? It failed, but were there any clues that would have prevented a loss this day. All right, let's go back to Wednesday. This last Wednesday, okay, the 9th of January, okay. All right, let's go. Let's go look. I'm gonna pull mine up over here. So the 9th, we had an IB extension to the downside or to the upside? Oh, that was when they went ahead and- it was FOMC minutes. Yeah, 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 that's what it was. We had terrible trade that day, it was terrible. I didn't have a trade, I don't think I had a trade that day. Um, I have to go back and look. Yeah. So, I mean, a couple things on this, Ivan, the, the trade actually, so the first extent, so, okay, first thing, where's the first extension? It's to the downside. Okay. Right here. What time did that happen at? It was in C period where you got IB low extension. So it was before the notes. It was before the notes. Yep. And, and see this point of control, this high volume area right here. Um, so this thing extended and then, and then pushed into that, into that area. You know, typically one of the things that we look at is, and you can see, I've got this, uh, IB extension metric on here. The reason that we use the IB extension metric is because we have behavioral stats around that that say, okay, like the, I 50% extension of the IB would have been 65, 45. And again, there's only 25% chance I'm going to get past that price. There's a 17% chance I'll get past 65.20. Now, the next thing that you look at is you go, okay, are there any high volume areas or areas of significance in that path? And there was right here. And, you know, we came in, tested that, and then got back inside of the IB range. So that, at that point, you know, you would have had to get further acceptance below this level to make a push for the next level at 65.15. So something maybe to help you out on that is when you're looking at IB extensions, what we discussed is, okay, what's the width of that, ex the, the IB that helps first. Then what, what, what work do we have to get through to what, what do we have to get through to make this work? Do we have, like Josh was just saying, we had a high volume note below there. Well, we have to work through that to make this thing work long term. So are they just going to go down poke and, you know, run some stops and turn it back around and go take the other side out. Well, yeah, well, that's what they did. Okay. In hindsight, but you got to look at stuff like that. If we were looking at that, we'd be very cautious on that one. Yeah. I mean, yeah. other, other aspects of that, that would have, would have been more cautious is it was a FOMC Bennett's. We knew Powell was going to talk that day. Um, Matter of fact, I think he was at that time, wasn't he? Yeah, he was talking at that time. So, I mean, it was, it was just kind of a, you, you were going to be more consistent or, or be more conservative around it. And um, yeah, so alternatively though, if you waited and watched based on that information, mm -hmm. the alternative was an IB fade where it comes back into the IB range and holds, yeah. which it did. And it give you another opportunity with good risk reward to the upside, maybe test the, the upside of the IB. That's a high percentage trade right there. Yeah, that was that was the actually the better trade is once they came once they got this and got back. So you can either go with the extension or you can fade the extension. 
you know, it's like right now with the NASDAQ, you could go with this extension, but the question is to where, um, or you can fade it. Well, we have a pretty, pretty good target that you could fade back to, and that's all where all this volume has been built out today. Um, you know, the, the where, well, there is a node up here at 63.30, so that could be your target, and that's also um, within, if I, if I look at today's extension, that's, you know, that's a little bit past the 50% extension of the range. So, I mean, that, this could be, because we had such a tight range earlier, um, that could work. That, that actually, and the fact that we're also going into the afternoon, yeah. um, and that's still inside Globex range, like that could really, that could really work. So, you know, you start, you start with, uh, okay, once you see the extension, that tells you who's, who's in control at the moment. Um, and then it's like, do I go with them or do I fade it? And, you know, if I go with it, I can always wait for a pullback before I hit some target, which is either that 50% extension or a high volume node like it was on the eighth. Um, or you can, you know, fade it and go the other direction and look for the rotation back in that, that actually was a higher probability trade was to back back towards this high volume area that was building. And you would have used that as your risk. Okay. Look at the eight. Yeah. Now I remember the eighth. I was actually short on that one. Um, and we did go down to a, a high volume area. Uh, I was looking at Globex had a high volume area, but that was just the head fake. There's nothing I could have done to, to now. We did get some off on that, but that was a head fake on the eighth to the downside. And then they ripped it back to the upside, which was just telling you, hey, listen, they're not ready to take this market down. Okay. They found responsive buyers in there. Yeah. So on the, so, on the eighth, same, same, same thing. And, and here's, here's the thing, you know, I would say is like, okay, and I, if I go back and look at the plan on the 8th, I would have said, I believe if we got IB low extension. So we opened with a gap, actually. And this is a small gap. so a little bit higher probability we closed that. Um, you know, so you can see how we got back into the prior day's range. But then on IB low extension, you had a pretty cool target here at 65, 16. But, okay, but look at the if, – if you bought – if you sold at the IB low extension, and we always talk about, you know, in our development pathway, we talk about risk-reward, risk-reward, risk-reward. Um, Where's your risk? Where's your, you know, well, the reward, I can kind of see that. I mean, that would, that's, that's the clearly definitive target would have been the 6515, but where's my risk? Well, I mean, really the top of B period. So I'm, I'm kind of a one-to-one. -one. It's not a really great risk reward. I, you know, so I, I can't, I'd have to go back and I don't think I took this trade. I was looking for, you know, when the extension happened, I was looking for a rotation back up towards the open for an, another push lower where I could get a bigger swath with tighter risk. And you can see that they actually operated in the other direction. They, you know, they got up there back towards the open, but it came later in the session. Um, and my, just to be clear, my risk, I dropped down to a lower time frame. Yeah. And so here was my trade. My trade was to a lower time frame, identified risk, got some off, got stopped out on the second portion of it. Once we got the reversal back, um, there was some opportunity to the upside then at that point. So yeah, let's look it at was that. an if then. We sort of go work with an if then, at least I do on mm -hmm. that. So mm -hmm. just, just a good way of doing it. Don't get, again, that just says don't get stuck to one side because the auction can change pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah, this, I mean, here's, here's the, here's the IB break right here. There just, there was no, there was just no pullback at all. So, I mean, this was kind of the base of where the selling started. Yeah. So the, uh, if on a shorter, go back to that chart, would you? On a shorter time frame, mark the IB on that, would you? Uh, can you on the, uh, just a regular line? Yeah. So here's, here's the IB low. Okay. Oh, wait, I'm not, I'm, I think I'm on the wrong date. There's a little higher, wasn't it? Well, here's here's 8:30 right here. So there's that's oh yeah. So this is actually the IBLO right here. Uh, let's see here. That was on the eighth, right? Yep. So I've got 65.08 and some change. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, okay so what happens is. Once we break that definitively, and I'm, I'm short, my, as a tight stop personally, again, personally, yeah, I'm just right above there, okay? Um, and I'm just gonna start peeling some off and I'm gonna watch order flow at that point. 
Um, it did roll back into the IB. I got stopped out. Um, then they start to reverse that thing. And then there's a couple opportunities into the later, latter part of the day there. So, mm -hmm. but understand IBs just aren't the, the probability. And I think this is where you're going at. Um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, of course, but the, an IB is just not going to break and go for 200 points. It just doesn't work like that. Okay. So the IB will give you great risk reward if it sets up correctly. Okay. And it has some potential really good targets, mm -hmm. but in some respects, you're not going to get that. There's just going to, there's going to be days it doesn't work. So if that's not the trade that you like, then you probably need to look at a different type of trade, which could be the alternative, which is an IB fade. Mm -hmm. All right. It may, you know, for me, actually the fade is a better trade. I'm, I'm a terrible go with trader, horrible with them. Cause for one, it's just what Josh said. It's hard to identify risk. So hey, real me, quick, real quick. I, um, we're, we're like 20 minutes over here and, oh. I appreciate anybody hanging around. If, if you want to hang around with us, that's great. If not, we're just, I mean, we'll just field questions. If you want to stick with us, that's fine. You know, I'll stay around for another 10 minutes. Um, yeah. And we but, need to land the Learjet. So. Yeah. But th <laughs> thanks to <for> everybody. <laughs> uh, and you know, we'll try to finish in you know, the rest of these questions, but um, yeah. Thanks yeah, guys. Awesome. For... Have a fantastic weekend yep. and uh, we'll see you next week. Yep. But uh, let's see. So anyway, so my, where I was going with that is just, you know, if that's not the style that you like, then um, that's, you know, you just may want to look at another type of trade that works for your, your style. Now, the other thing too, is you have to remember what's the market providing for you. I mean, the last few, this week has been a really um, low volume tight. I mean, not very big ranges. We've seen actually the ranges go down. I think, let me double check here. Um, let me look at my ATR here real quick. Yeah, we ATR has been just going down here in the last week. So our ranges, while they're still still wide, they're not as wide, and and it's been choppy. So it's been difficult to see that stuff. Um, so don't get again. Don't. I mean, it's been nice. Yeah, you know, I mean, we've had some really good IB breaks. I mean, they've been great this last couple months. But I can also. I can also say that back in April, May, June, July of last year, if you got an IB break and, and got 10 points, man, you were, you were jumping for joy, okay? Because it was not easy trading back then. It was very, very difficult. So it was just yeah. a grind higher every day. So if you, if you go back and look at, you know, a number of these Q&As, and, we, and this, this I, the IB trade is the core of our, of our playbook, um, and you can, you can go with it or you can fade it. Now, a, think an, I, an IB, um, an IB tells you, hey, who's in control? And the reason why we say that tells you in control is because about 70% of the time, depending, you know, what product you're trading, it's going to be 68 to 70% of the time. Once we've extended in one direction, that's it. So the fact that we have IB high extension here in the NASDAQ, that, ne that now means there's only a 30% probability we'll see 65.73 today, right? So that helps you conceptualize and put probability around a risk parameter. So you can have an ultimate risk parameter of IB low. You know that buyers are step sticking their heads out there. So, so you, you can find places to go with them. But to JP's point, statistically they're not going to extend it very much so what that means is okay i've got i i can if i can be patient if we're having a rotational day i could look for opportunities back in this direction to buy because i know there are other buyers there or i can let them get out in these areas in the nosebleeds and then look to fade back in and you need to define that in your trade setup what works yeah. for you not one of those trades are right okay it's That's what's right, right for you um, I'm to, I'll be the first to admit, I hate, the, I'm not a big IB break guy. I, um, it has to set up very perfectly for me. Um, you know, we had uh, going back to that, um, the ninth, right. On that IB break, we, we broke si both sides of IB, uh, the IB, right. But then the news came out and it was almost trying to threaten to go back down and take out the, the IB again. Well, we know we had less than a 3% chance of them to go back down and break that IB out again. So we know that it broke one side, went to the other side and broke it. Now to go all the way back, travel all the way back down, even on, a, um, on, a, um, uh, on an event, then the percentages are so low to do that. 
So you wouldn't be looking for that. That's right. Anyway. Um, yeah, it was, John. It was manageable. So, um, and that's the key is manage these things. Oh, I think he was referencing the fact that he's joined us from uh, South Africa. Oh, eight thirteen. Man, it's late there. I need to get some rest. <laughs> that's only it's just six, it's just six thirty local. Is it? Yeah. Six. Okay, so it's not too bad. It's still late on a Friday. Yeah. <laughs> six thirty. <laughs> everybody's out doing something different other than in front of the markets. Um. Yeah, six thirty. Not too bad. Okay. All right. Any last questions here before we land the jet? Look, look so at fading this thing back in there you go that's um so they're back inside they're back inside that um actually on this template it's kind of i have this colored so you can see they're back inside that initial balance range mm. blow that up just a tad more so is that a five minute 30 minute okay 30 so they're minute. they're creating some access here in the 30 minute mm -hmm. So now, now I don't I highly not recommend you take yeah, this, but no, no, no. if you were going to do something like this, let's say it's me and I'm looking at this. Well, then at this point, uh, as soon as that 30 minute closes, if we close back inside the IB, then I'm looking for shorter time frame triggers to the downside. Um, probably stops are going to have to be back above there, but I got to identify some targets. And at this point, I'm not looking at that. So Ooh, now they're really... Starbucks got those singles. They did? Oh, yep. nice. There you yeah. go. There you go. Cleaned them up. Cleaned them up. Clean up on aisle three. But that's why we, you know, there you had a choice. Defend fend the IB break or tighten it up. I'm glad. I, I, for me personally, it would have been a tighten up uh, trade, especially on a Friday. So there's some divergence there, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, they're Russell. selling off the Nasdaq. The Russell's going higher. There's a there's a big high volume note up here in the rut that this 1461. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, John. You too, man. Enjoy. All right, guys. Last call. Any other questions before we uh, move it along here for the weekend? And if we don't, I just obviously I want to wish everybody a great weekend and get out, get away from the screens. If you're going to do some studying, that's great. Mm -hmm. um, do that, but don't don't spend all weekend doing that. Just get away, get refreshed, come back on Monday, go from there. So, absolutely. All right, I don't see any other questions, Josh. So you got permission to land this turkey. All right. Um. Yeah, um, those two questions. Uh, consider spending a week with us. Um, this is just if if you got value out of today, um, know that it, we are at this level every day for a whole week around the specific area. So whether you like us or not, <laughs> whether you like us or not, uh, this is kind of a high level touch of what we were doing. Uh, connect with us on Twitter and Facebook, and then you can always if you need help or um, have any questions, you can send us an email at team at Trades Profile or give us a call and uh, thanks for sticking with us. We'll, we'll see you next week. Yeah, guys, take care. Have a good weekend. Here. And we were talking about, where did Matt say that? Uh, oh yeah. They crushed the Delta in, in crude. So here's what this looks like. And Delta is a, is a measurement that looks at the, the difference between, uh, trades on the on the bid versus the ask and we'll look at this this way so an in, internal metric that we use from is what an order flow so there is there's two ways to look at it there's the the order flow per period and then there's the cumulative so you can see that the cumulative uh price action delta how the auction was going today was strong, strong, strong to the buy side uh, up until we had the EIA report. And then look what happened. They just, they basically said, nope, we're not interested <laughs> in buying this anymore. So that's where they crushed. They, they just, they base almost, uh, almost halved 
the uh, cumulative delta for the full session, if we look at the RTH, which is just the cash session, um, you can see they actually went negative. So um, that's what we meant by crush the delta. Like the, the delta was positive up until that point, and then it, it got crushed. Uh, if, if you look here at the NASDAQ and why, why it's going to be hard for the NASDAQ to go lower um, is, you know, look what's happening. Look what's happening to the cumulative delta. And as we're having subsequent periods, they're just buying. So all of the orders are to the buy side, to the buy side, to the buy side. And that's, if you can't see stuff like this and you try to short this, you're going to, and, and you might say, well, I need, you know, I should short it because we're already up like, you know, 150 points. That's, we're stretched, right? Well, no, because the behavior is saying that they're still stretching it, to, or they're still doing a good job facilitating trade to the upside. So until you see that change, um, and they're just increasing it, or you know, see it diverge, it's going to continue to um, pull pullbacks. Pullbacks offer opportunities to join the trade. Yeah, Mike's got a good question too. He said you mentioned the best times to trade in the morning, but what a, what's the best times to trade in the afternoon? Yep. Um, well, there, let me answer that two different ways. After lunch, okay. Um, and I've, what I would say before the 30 minutes before the end of the cash close, um, I think if you're trading into the cash close, it's a risky proposition. Um, yep. So that that's probably the better times because typically after lunchtime, that's Eastern Standard Time lunch. So 12 noon Eastern Standard Time um, after that time frame, probably 1, 1.30 uh, into that close, um, but prior 30 minutes prior to the cash close. So those are probably the, the optimal times. Um, I will have I will tell you, though, um, it, I know I am, and I think Josh as well as unless it's really active, we're, we're less likely to trade afternoon. Yeah. Um, now, with that being said, we just discussed this the other day with the team um, inside uh, the channel is that, you know, it's important that you go back throughout the whole year and look at every one of your trades and find out where you were more, most successful and your times. Was it off the open? Was it at the uh, nine o'clock time frame? Was it the one o'clock time frame? You know, where, where was your most successful trades at? That actually will give you the best time to trade. Like, you know, if you're more successful off that open, you have your, your trade plan says, you know, this is, I've got this trade off the open. It's really working well for me. Then that's probably where you want to focus at. Um, and then ignore the rest because it's not about trading all the time. It's, you know, it's about capturing, the, uh, capturing your funds and then, you know, knowing where your sweet spot is and then get the heck out of there. That's right. I mean, this is not a 24 seven casino. I mean, it is, but <laughs> it's not a casino. Let's not act like that. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, good question. Yeah, it is a great question actually. All right. What insights can one derive from observation for four auction behaviors? Oh, Josh, I'll let you take that one. That's a great question, Tony. Very good question. So I'm just let sure. some sellers step in on that NASDAQ. Yeah, but but they're so well, this is relevant to the, the question one from the four auction behaviors. So look here. Um, okay, what direction is this auction trying to go? I mean, that's, that's where you start. And, you know, here, here was the a beginning, you know, we had, we had auction kind of uh, resting and then we had the Powell comments and then we have a beginning. And since that beginning, uh, we've just, you know, every, every spot where we, ba you know, based, um, you know, we would then, you know, pause for a second and then, you know, have another area that we base. And then we have another area that we, you know, you can see these little, buying spikes here okay um and you know we we are not taking any of those out so this this is a move and you know what we're looking for is well where's the end of the move and we don't know where that is yet so what we have to watch is we have to say okay well where where does that behavior um you know here's more development it can't get below this here's another 
you know, spike. Now the spikes are getting weaker as we get later in the day, um, which says, you know, it could be coming soon, but um, we're waiting for the behavior that would shut off this, this auction. So you, you're looking for uh, behavior in the counter direction that would be strong enough to shut off the upside auction. So until you see that, there's, there's no reason to think that this thing is done as a move. So how do you, you know, how can you use that? What do you, can you derive from that? Is if you're long, there's no reason to be short. And if you want to be short, there's no reason to be short at this point. So, you know, you're just kind of watching it. And, you know, what basically how I'm doing it is I'm just kind of, I've, I've been moving uh, alerts because I, I, see, I see opportunity and I see poor structure in this profile. Now, I also know it's a Friday. I know that volume is going to start, I think, to start, you know, typically would start to wane, um, you know, as we go go lower but uh, unless I get some strong sellers to come in and stop this one time framing higher behavior I there's just not a good probability that I'm gonna get any rotation plus I can see that the point of control has migrated higher so when people are migrating value higher that's a good indication that we're gonna continue to push higher and you know so that's how I can use those those behaviors intraday um, you know and what what I take out of that let me let's look at an example here you know, when I say, you know, it's shut off in one direction. Okay. Yeah. You know, here was, here was crude moving higher. And then um, you can actually see there was some buy volume, but the price action like significantly took back prior higher moves. And then all you saw was sellers coming in after that. So that basically is saying now, okay, um, the, the up move from yesterday is done. And now I'm, now the auction is going to start balancing and go into a behavior we call rest. Um, and I, you know, I basically have, until we can t make new highs of a 49.20, that's at least one side of this balancing zone. I don't know where the other side is. Um, I think my premise is it's down here at 46.80. So what I'm now looking for is I'm looking for opportunities to be short for the move down here. You know, places that I can express some risk. And, and you know, for the NAS, and again, Friday, I, my rules say that I'm done already for Friday. Yep. Um, it, so if I were, if this is a regular day, I would be looking actually for that last 30 minute candle low to get taken out before I would get interested to the downside. In this case, it would be on the NASDAQ 6380 halves. Yep. So other than that i'm sitting on my hands just the, there's just i mean for one it's too late to buy up here at this point it needs a rest for a little while um so th this is one of those things that keeps you from chasing and doing silly things mm -hmm. so all right anybody else have any great that was a good question tony thanks um any other good questions Throw it out there. I know somebody's got something going on. They got to and nothing, nothing's, there's no wrong questions. And if you have, if you're struggling with something and want to discuss it, throw it out there. Cause guess what? I'll tell you right now, anything that you're going through, we've gone through it period. Yep. yep. Do you guys have a Twitter page? Um, yep. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's trade with prof and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, uh, you can just search for, yeah. Trade with P R O F. It's actually here. I'll post it in the in the chat here. It's we rock. <laughs> it's at we rock doc. No, I'm just kidding. Yep. There you go. There you go. And we post some charts in there um, in the morning, typically. Yeah, we started. We started uh, posting some daily decision levels. Uh, we we post those in the evening. Um, because we, you know, we, we kind of determine the levels that we want to be active in the day prior or after we've seen the session. Um, hmm. Could it be? Could we get some sellers? See, at this point, I, I would have to see a, a, you know, just what JP said, I'd have to see a lower low on a 30 minute before I'd be interested. So this could just be pullback to find more buyers for the next leg higher. So I, I'm just... Until I see that, until I see some strong selling, uh-uh, not gonna, not gonna get lured in here because basically I'd be selling the pullback. <laughs> yeah, that would not be good. 
um, to, to, the recipe to get run yeah, over. The delta is really strong, and actually, vol so you got strong delta to the buy side, and on this platform, a negative number means strong buying volume. Also, note or buying delta. Also, notice on this histogram. So this is the cumulative of delta at prices. Look, it's all been to the buy side, all the buy side. So it doesn't mean you won't get little wiggles lower, but those you know right now are still opportunities to to buy pullbacks. They're not opportunities to go against this unless we could start. You know, if we could if we could make lower lows, if we could get back inside that initial balance range, then there's the chances of a trending behavior are diminished, and then it increases the probability that we could go after that interesting area that I'm excited about. Yeah, I want you guys to think about this too. Um, Frank, and I'm going to use Frank an example here. Frank has a great trade on Apple, right? He is he is going with the momentum, and you, know, you can call it a momentum trade, whatever you want. But he's he's with order flow at this point, and that's that's key. You want to be with order flow, um, and where the majority of the orders are going. And right now, they're not to the sell side. So if you're trying to fight this to the sell side and think you're going to get a big trade, um, it's not going to happen. Um, you think about it. We've ran off the open here. Um, we have – what have we ran here? Let's take a look. Yeah, here we go. I mean, you so, look at the, the total, total today, total high-low high range in the NASDAQ 280. Yeah. So, I mean, are we going to get a 100-point swing back? Um, yeah. I mean, we could get 50 points. That's 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 probably reasonable. But you know, when's that going to happen? I have no idea. Um, and are we going to get another 100 points up at this point? Um, that would that would be have to be one of the largest moves, um, you know, in one day, or a 300 point move. Um, so yeah. I don't I don't think that. What's our expected expected, expected range, range is basically 119 points today. I mean, we're way past that at this point. So I guess when you look at it that way, guys, you got to think, okay, I, how do I stay out of this thing? Mm -hmm. And there's a couple different ways. Get up and leave your computer. That's one way. Yeah. All right. Turn your any type of order entry off. Okay. Whatever you do, keep yourself from doing something silly. And that's what where the most problems with traders have. Most people that we talk to and we see have two issues going. And again, not to be, it's nothing to be embarrassed about. We've done it as well. But Josh and I, you know, what the thing that we can guarantee is that we've made every mistake in the book in the past. That's it. Yeah. Um, so what that does for you, though, guys, is is it keeps you out of losing money for silly reasons and re what we call reactive reasons. Okay, so the market went up today. Yeah, it did. Um, if you didn't get it, you know, guess what? I'm a, this is, I, I, I talk to people about this constantly. There's going to be many, 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 many more opportunities this year. You don't need this one opportunity. Remember, one opportunity is not going to make a year. However, one opportunity can ruin your career in trading. Okay, so think about that when you take a trade a little bit. And, and it, again, when we use the, the, the questions, um, those are the key, again, those, those are to, to put things in perspective and, and understand the context of what's going on and, and, and also what it means to your trade as well. Just to question mark. John, clarify that. I don't know what you mean by that. Sorry. I mean, so you were talking about the, uh, the spreadsheet. Um, are, you, are you talking about this, Frank? Oh, just a joke. <laughs> <laughs> just to, I got you, bud. Sorry. Uh, this, this is this is our trade plan. So for just our, <laughs> our pathway, we we send that out every morning in four different products. I it was talking, John was talking about two issues. He goes just two. And I go no, there's plenty more, buddy. I got a book full of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. But you know what? I hate. You know, it always makes me mad when somebody says, "Oh, it's the right of passage to be a trader." You know. Uh, yes and no. I mean, you're naturally probably going to make those trades. I wouldn't say, oh, since you made the, the mistakes, that you're a trader now. That's that's BS, right? Mm -hmm. You know, what makes you a trader is that you stop making those or you reduce them, right? And you learn the ways. I mean, we're all human. We're all going to, we have emotions. We're going to make emotional mistakes, but we have to be able to reduce those and, and be, be able to recognize them, why they're happening. So we don't make them. Um, because we still feel them. I mean, I, I feel them too. It makes pisses me off when we get a free, a big monster move, right? And you're not on board. You're like, Ugh, okay, that that's painful. So guess what? We got to wait again. And that's the hard part in trading is waiting. There it is.
a couple more questions. I mean, guys, great questions. Uh, so Ken, you're asking, is crude worth shorting here or would you wait for higher levels? Um, so I'm gonna give you the lawyer answer. <laughs> it, it depends. I, I mean, I like, I like the behavior. Uh, here's one way to think about this trade, okay? Um, we've got a really, really, really good target down here back to this 4680. Um, also with the gap close, we've got negative delta here. Look at the look at the daily candle. All right, so the, the daily bar is showing some good selling excess. So um, I mean, here, here's how I'm kind of trading this: is I, I'm short some, and I'm and I'm looking to short. You know, I would start to get nervous if we got above 4870, um, and I would absolutely be wrong if 4920 came before 4680. So that's from a behavior. Now, how you trade that and, you know, how you construct that trade, whether you do that with, you could do that with some options and you could do a, you know, you could do a call vertical spread, um, you know, or you could leg into the position and, you know, say, oh, I'm going to nibble here and uh, I'm going to look to um, add later. I, I would say if, like, if we don't get to 4680 today, um, Monday, I think, you know, if we open, say, in this area on Monday, I think there'd be a pretty cool opportunity up to this, you know, you'd look to test the 4880 area for then the move lower. So there's a, there's a number of different ways to do it based on your risk tolerance, your trade plan, your approach. So that's the, that's the lawyer answer there. Um, and that's one thing, um, that's a great question, by the way, and that's one thing that we want you guys to do is, to understand what works for you um, as a trader. In other words, develop your plan um, so you can be a strong independent trader. Um, so you're not running around from room to room to room trying to catch a move on somebody. Um, that's just not the way to do it long term. Yep. If you're, I mean, if you're serious about be, being a professional trader and making this a career or at least um, using this to build some type of, you know, future wealth for yourself, then you're, you're going to have to learn how to trade and set some parameters for yourself and rules and, and, you know, understand what works for you, what time frames work for you, what, a, you know, for me, there's no shorts involved on in, in crude today. It's done for me. Friday's done. I'm done for the week, period. That's my rules. Okay. But, you know, Josh may have, you know, well, he does have different rules than I do. Um, we do trade the same things um, and we do trade similar, but we have different rules within our, our plans. I just, I'm not a big fan of trading after 10 a.m. Um, well, that's my time. So 12 p.m. on a Friday. I, I've never had great luck. And if anything, I've always lost money after that time frame. And I, I could go back and look at all my trades and distinguish that. But I know it's always been painful. And going into a weekend with a, the last trade being a loss, yeah, that's just not what I want. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good word. A um, couple of questions. Scott, you're talking, you notice we don't mention ES very much. Is there a reason for that? Yes, there is a reason for that. So uh, his, now historically, we, we, I, kind of our styles, we like products that offer a decent opportunity. You know, and I get this question a lot of, okay, what's a good goal, uh, you know, like a target that I want to capture every day? And, you know, you'll see traders like, I want to make X amount of dollars per day. Well, I, I struggle with that perspective because there's not the same opportunity every day. So how can you how can you gauge your expectations relative to the opportunity that's in front of you? And I, I like to think of that in terms of a, a percentage of the range. So I want to capture 25% of the range. That's, that's an A plus for me on any given day. Well, because the range is going to be different. There's different day types, you know, that's going to be different. And, and historically for the amount of margin requirement, the NASDAQ offers more opportunity than the ES. Also, you know, just as a way to distinguish ourselves, there's a blue million people given commentary on the ES and there, there are not as many people talking about the NASDAQ. So um, that's why we talk about it. Now, um, we have been talking more about the ES of late. And the reason for that is because the ES is trading right now more like what we would typically experience in the NASDAQ in, in more normalized vol uh, volatility uh, times. So we've been trading more ES um, just because it's, it's, more, it's moving more. You know, like it's, it's doing, I mean, good grief. Look at this. It's got 50 points. Um, that's a, that's a, that's a massive ES day. It is. They and not only that, if, if, if the, if the NASDAQ is very, I mean, all the markets are volatile right now, but 
when that happens and you got to widen stops and you know, your account maybe not be able to handle that and you could maybe manage risk a little bit better in the ES during, and, and right now it, you are able to do that. And even we would even suggest maybe going down to the bonds in that case um, to be able to manage risk because of just the volatility alone will kill you. Yep. And we just don't want that. Mm -hmm. um, can I make a comment on that? You know, we get that question of what, you know, what to make every day. Mm -hmm. um, that was something that I know Josh had done at the very beginning, as did I. You make this elaborate plan. Okay, if I can get 10 points a day out of the market, you know, we've got an ATR of, you know, 60 and 80 and stuff like that. I should be able to capture that. Um, that's logical and that's what you want and I get that but here's the thing execute if you execute your plan properly you'll make enough money mm -hmm. okay but if you're if you're worried about the cash then then that's when psychological issues will start to creep in and that will keep you from making money um, believe it or not it does so we would rather you focus on execution and then at that point you can increase contracts based on your 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 account size um, and then the money will come. Okay. Um, most people, unfortunately, in the world are trading onesies and twosies out there, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, Josh and I started that way, and in and in certain situations, we will trade a one or two lot. There's no doubt about it. Um, but when you start adding contracts down the road, and when you're comfortable in your methodology, you've proven yourself, and your account size is to where it needs to be, then you can um, you can um, you know, then you can increase contract size. And then at that point, um, the, the money will be there for you. Um, so please focus less on that. Um, yeah, I saw something come in. Do we use uh, volume pro intraday volume, intraday volume profile for determining specific execution levels, entry stops and targets? Absolutely. Yes. So um, that's, um, you know, in terms of like, if, if the NASDAQ rollover, which I don't think it's going to, I, think we, I mean, we're trending. We're, this is a trend day. I think by the end of the day, we could be 64.50 and higher. Um, you know, same, I think as long as we keep on the, you know, the, the trend here, um, if we can't, if we can't get a lower low on a 30 minute in another hour, then we're done. We're just going to trend into the close today. Um, but let, let's say, let's say it wasn't a Friday. Okay. Um, oh, I don't want to do that. And um, I've got, you know, I've got a, a decision level up here, 64.48. I've got today's point of control at 63.94. Okay. If I got up here and found a short-term trigger, there could be a responsive move back. My target would be back towards where the, that high volume area is. So yeah, we absolutely use, use those throughout the day. Um, I mean, we also use Globex too, um, just to look. I mean, I'm looking at Globex right now um, and Globex and um, Intraday combined. And we just, obviously we're up over some important levels here um, at about uh, 64.07. And man, it's, there's nothing, there's nothing above us all the way up. Um, geez, 65.75. Yeah, I, I think, I think they're just going to run this thing. Yeah. It wouldn't surprise me to see us close the week on, on the highs yeah. and I'm almost to the tick. Yeah. Um, and you know, that, that's a story. A lot of times we talk about, um, by the way, Frank, I did see that, that process over P and L brother is always a good motto. Great, great, uh, great comment there. But we always talk about, we want to see how it closes today because it tells a story for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that real quick. If we get a close like what we're just discussing right now, and Josh has a great chart up. So let's say we go up um, to that high volume note above. Josh, what is that number? I can't see that. 65, uh, 6543. All right. So let's say we go up and we close on that number just hypothetically. So what does, we, we talk about biases a lot. What does Monday, what's the thought process maybe coming into Monday just based on that close right there? Well, that would say that, okay, that's pretty bullish. Now, are we going to have a reversal right there? Mm, I, w I mean, we could get a little bit of pullback, but we're looking for certain areas to hold, which would be just that last area we just broke out of um, uh, where the swing bias to the long side starts, right? 
Um, now, we're not talking about swings here today, but regardless, we would see we would want that on Monday that level to hold right there. Okay, now would they come back and test that level? I don't know. They could just rotate it uh, on Monday and then you know, and then maybe in the afternoon. Uh, you, you've heard the term. This is a a trend or a, a day after trend day, right? Um, and the day after you usually get a, a little bit of rotation in the morning. Um, and then from there, they may punch it into the afternoon if, if the market is still strong. And in this case, the buyers are still in control. However, they could pull it back a little bit as well. But we would want to see that area um, hold, which would then give us what a long bias still going in. Now, if we open up um, Monday morning and the Globex we sold off, there's been some geopolitical issues and stuff like that. And now we're back into, you know, we're way back down into the range again. Um, then all bets are off. We have to find a different bias on that. So when we look at the close today, that will help us set up our bias coming into Monday morning. Does that make sense? Yep. Yes, indeed. Bueller. Bueller. Yep. <laughs> it does. It does. This, by the way, this, this, high volume level here. So, you know, if we can't get there, other the comment I'd say is we can't get here today, um, and, but we close, so you can see we actually we're in a low volume area right here. Um, you know, this, which is a, a place that we could actually reject and find sellers. So we'll, we'll watch that. Um, but if we push through that and close above that, then uh, we've got kind of a range for next week, you know, that's kind of in this area. And, uh, and then if, you know, I, I think for this year, for 2019, I mean, really, for the, the auction to really take off, we'd have to get back above the 6,700 area um, to, to go significantly higher this year. That's going to be kind of the first hurdle. Um, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll kind of see how that, that goes. Scott. Uh, okay. So we have two questions, Scott, and then I'll, Josh, I'll let you answer Joel's question. Um, Scott, great. This is a great question. What are the two mistakes traders make well i could write a book about mistakes on trading um i would and josh weigh in on this as well i would say the number one mistake that i see traders make and it, they all it it's not one mistake that it, they sort of tie together um they don't have a, a they don't have a plan in other words they don't have they have never identified what their trade is What's their sweet spot? Okay, where's the bag of money laying in the corner? Okay, and because of that, they're making up trades as it goes and they become reactive to situations like what we just saw today. So when the market flies and you don't have a plan, like you've heard Josh and I talk about today, what happens is you have a tendency to tr chase. And, and, and I, as I always say with chasing, it's like, uh, dogs who chase cars. Okay. I'm a dog lover. I got one. So don't, please don't email me with any, um, you know, comments, but it's like that. I mean, listen, dogs who chase cars, I grew up in the country. Uh, they don't last long. Okay. Um, so bottom line here is one thing leads to another. That's number one mistake that I always see. Okay. Number two mistake is even though you do identify your trade setups, you don't follow them. Mm -hmm. which leads to the same problems. Yep. Now there's all kinds of little mistakes in there that you can make. Oh, I wasn't paying attention. I didn't have enough time. I'm trading outside my time zone, you know, stuff like that, that that's, those are pretty easy fix. But the, the, the number one, number two, or excuse me, the two mistakes that I see are really tied to the same thing. Have no plan, chase trades, do silly things, make up trades, um, you know, you're reactive, um, impulsive, and then two, you do make a trade plan and you still become impulsive and, and reactive. And then we got to dig a little bit deeper than to figure that out, why you are acting that way. And two, what are things that we can do to keep you from doing that? Um, I always said traders should have hire somebody to sit next to them the whole time with a board in their hand. And anytime they think about taking a trade that's not theirs, they get the board. Mm -hmm. that'll stop you real quick. So I hope that helps Scott. I mean, that's what I see mostly. And that was probably my biggest challenge starting. So, and Joel has a really good question too. I'll let you go with that one. Yeah. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't add anything to, um, I, well, I, I would add one thing, uh, 
this is this is implied from what JP was talking about, but um, having a plan, a, t a real tactical aspect of this, having a playbook. Uh, there's a specific setup that I'm looking for, and I know what that is, and I know when to look for that. Um, which, I mean, this is actually an adjustment that I've been making this year. As I go look back at my performance, I'm like, you know, I I I still want to be active a lot on the open. And I look at my trade logs and my trade performance. And I'm like, I'm not that great on the open. Like I, I end up getting in my heels or getting in a position I have to defend too much. So uh, I've actually altered my approach this year where, you know, I'm preparing in the evening and I'm letting, I'm, I'm sleeping in. <laughs> I'm, I'm that is a nice thing. thing. <laughs> you know, which, you know, cause I, I live, you know, and I live in the mountain standard time. So it's, I mean, it's an early day anyway. Um, but you know that that's or or when it gets warmer, I mean, I can go out for a run or I can you know do something before the market, uh, before the time that I know that I have better expectancy, and then just work on that. And if I want to be active early, that's fine. But I'll just do that in a sim mode, um, or I you know I have one trade in my setup that is a really great open trade or in my playbook. And if unless those conditions are there, and I don't touch it, um, so. Josh mentioned something's really good. Totally agree. And and Josh mentioned mentioned something really important is you know, it allows him to do other things, which tells you you're able to, to wait and be patient. That is the hardest thing for anybody who is a trader because when you're not making money in the markets, you, you, what the feeling, the psychological feeling that sort of creeps in is, oh, I'm not doing anything. I'm not being proactive. Okay, I should make something happen. I should make money, which goes back to what Frank had says, work on your, your, your process, not your P&L. You're thinking about P&L rather than process. Okay, and in this case, you you want to be thinking about your process, and when you know when the good times are, then you'll be there for them if they're if they're available, and if not, you move on. Remember, there's many. There'll be many. I want you to think about this. There's going to be many, 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 many opportunities today. And when I say that, I'm going to say thousands of opportunities for you to trade this year, and if that's the case, then you don't need this one. You're going to miss a couple. And then there's a lot, there's more than a thousand opportunities, there's gazillions of opportunities that you think you should take, but they're not part of your plan. So it's important to wait. And it's totally against what we were ever taught in school or in our jobs or anything like that, because we're taught to be proactive, go study hard, work hard, you'll get what you want. And you still need to do that in trading, but it looks a little bit different and feels a little bit different, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, all right, Joel, your question about Window Trader. Um, so you don't have it now. So this, this platform that we're looking at right now is Window Trader. And in my humble opinion, it is, it is the best platform on the market, um, especially for profile traders. Why, why or why should you not? So let me, let me talk with the why not is um, it's, I mean, it could be cost prohibitive. You're gonna have to, you're gonna have to buy data to, to feed this sucker. And there's a, a, um, you know, a, a fee for, per I use Window Trader Blue, and um, there's Window Trader Blue or Window Trader Light, and um, you know, it's it's a good chunk of change every month to to have this platform and be able to see what I want to see. So it, the the cost can be a, a prohibitive aspect to it. Um, the upside is what it allows me to see that other platforms can't allow me to see, specifically around focus. Um, you know, I. When, I, when I'm doing an audit of a trader setup, you know, often there's just so many screens and charts and stuff that they're looking at. So right now, okay, right now, aside from my execution platforms, what you're looking at on your screen is all I can see of the market, of any market. This is it. Uh, because, you know, I believe very, very heavily in the need to be able to be able to focus on, on the job at hand. And um, because the auction is taking place in multiple time frames because there's participants that think in different, you know, you got, and what I mean by multiple time frames, think of it like uh, participants in a housing market. You have some people who are house flippers and you have some people who are like, I bought this house and I'm going to hold it forever. And you have some people who buy investment properties because they want to get the rent out of it. Like they all are operating in the same market space. And so they have different points of reference. And what this allows me to do is this allows me to say, okay, I, I have the TPO chart. I've got contract volume at price. I've got the volume profile. I've got the composite profile. I've got the Delta. I've got auction statistics. When I get ready to trigger, I can turn on 
Um, you know, this is, you know, five minute uh, delta uh, periods overlaid a histogram with volume. Like I can see all of that in one spot. And I, I, I've not seen another platform that allows me to do that. Um, can, can you see all of this information in most other platforms? Uh, yes, but you have to have multiple screens and windows to see it. And, you know, the more places your eyes have to look, it's like driving a car. You know, the more things that are distracting me when I'm driving, uh, the more cognitive dissonance can come into play. So that's, that's why I'm such a, a big fan of the platform because it just allows me to, to really focus on areas and not, you know, get lured by shiny pennies and, and other stuff like that. And it's ultimately, it's very customizable. The other thing about it that's different than other uh, platforms is the ability to do things by color. So, um, you know, right now you can see that the red is higher intensity of color or this deep blue, that's a higher intensity of volume. So I can real quickly just look and go, oh, I know where the high volume areas are. Um, the white, that's low volume. That's the lowest 40% of volume on the day. So I know where the low volume areas are, right? I'll, I can just look at it and instantly know where that is. Um, where other platforms, they don't allow you to have, like, like if you look here at uh, Thinkorswim, which Thinkorswim is fine. Um, and I can do some color variation on profiles, but you know, if I look at intraday, there, I just have to look at the actual shape of the profile. I don't, I don't, I can't see, um, you know, really any granularity about that. I, you know, here's where I'm having to look across three different or four different charts to see the same information I can see in, you know, one chart. And Toss doesn't allow me to see any kind of order flow data at all. Um, that's something they don't, they still don't have. So that's my, that's my pitch on Window Trader. I think it's awesome. I think, I think good traders have good tools. So. Uh, if, if you want to explore Winter Trader, you know Terry Lieberman at Winter Trader is a good friend of ours, and happy to make that introduction. And he'll he'll walk you through it and um, give you the whys and wherefores on it. Um, oh, we've got a couple here. questions yeah, regarding yeah. Um, regarding yeah, about a playbook. Yeah, Frank, I, I get nothing. But, uh, yeah, so yeah, I, Sierra charts. Let's answer that one. Sorry, okay. Sierra charts is a good entry level one. Absolutely, um, it gives you everything you need. It's a little bit clunky, but it does work well, um, it, and it's definitely affordable. Um, if you're just starting out in the profile, um, depending on what level you are, um, that may be an option for you. I agree with Josh. Uh, Window Trader Blue is a phenomenal one because it all comes in one spot, and that's hard to find. Matter of fact. I don't think you can find it um, in the profile mix. So do you want to take those other questions? Yeah, yeah. So um, talk about uh, uh, the playbook. So so there's in terms of products. So Frank, you got our build a profile course. So we have a build a profile course, which is our self-directed 12 video course, which is, is if somebody has never experienced the profile, doesn't have any int introduction to it. And even if they've never even traded before in their life, it's a fantastic foundation. I, I wrote that course a year ago when I had lots of friends who were like, I need to buy Bitcoin, you know, and they were getting wrapped up in that. And I was like, oh my gosh, people are going to lose lots of money, which they would have if they had bought Bitcoin. They would have lost their shorts, um, you know, because Bitcoin basically made a high. <laughs> okay, interesting side note. Bitcoin made the high the Sunday before the futures were released. And we can talk about that later as to why that was significant. Um, but in our, our, our main development pathway, which is our profile development pathway, which is a 16-week course, uh, very immersive and intensive. In that one, we go over the playbook and actually work with you to build your playbook and your trade plan. So what I'd say is, you know, go, go, through, um, go through the Build a Profile course. That'll give you a good foundation. It'll, it'll get you acquaint, acquainted with a lot of what we're talking about. And then, you know, once you're through that, then do a trial with us and our, our trade plan and profile pathway. Um, would you explain the rationales of one of your trade plan or playbook? So, um, rationales. Ask, ask that. Oh, I understand what you're looking for there, Tony. Yeah, clarify that a little bit more. I guess the rat, I mean, if we're rationally, if we're, we're trying to make it, um, why we have it, um, 
Yeah, you, why we have a trade plan or a playbook or? Uh, you you got to have it in this business. Um, and and it, what it does is it keeps you steadfast on what you're trying to accomplish. You Again, I go back to what Frank had said earlier, process, that's your process. Yeah. It tells you, it gives you, you know what you're looking for. You know, if you just, you know, if you're, if you're a hunter or anything like that, you, you go out, you take your gun, you start hunting. Do you know what you're hunting for? You're just going out to shoot something, you know? Uh, you're probably not going to get anything. And if you get it, it may be the wrong thing and you're going to get fined for it. But, <laughs> um, but if you, hey, I got my, my deer tag or I'm at my elk tag if you're up in Josh's neck of the world, um, I'm going to go out and get me an elk today. So you're more specific on what you're going to do. You know what the time frames are. You know what the, when you can hunt that person or that elk. Um, and then you know, um, you know how big it can be, how big it has to be, et cetera, et cetera. So you know all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Another way I, I, I'll try to answer that question, Tony, is so your know, rationale. There's so that in a in a trade plan, uh, as traders, we're making decisions on what we call the hard right hard right edge of the of the market, right? So I'm you know I'm making decisions based. I'm I'm going to make subjective decisions on where I believe the auction is going to go next based on the behavior that I'm seeing. Uh, two questions that we always ask is, you know, what direction is the auction trying to go and how good of a job is it doing at that? Because, because we know this, I mean, not just financial markets, but any market. If, if I see an auction that's attempting higher, so like right now, the NASDAQ's attempting higher. Okay, well, how good a job is it at doing that? What are things that would tell me it's doing a good job? Well, uh, pullbacks are bringing in more buyers. Um, we have successfully been migrating value higher. Volume is still good at higher prices. Um, you know, we've got kind of a skew of inventory uh, to the upside here. Uh, so or this, this, is a, this is, you know, what I'd call an incomplete auction to the upside. This is a trend day and trend days, you know, it's a, it's a very directionally convicted day. And so in, unless something happened in the trend or negated the trend, um, we're going to continue to expect this thing would go, go higher. So we, we build in a trade plan, you're building an expectation. You're writing a narrative of kind of if this, then that statements. So here, here's where the auction is attempting to go. Here's how good of a job it's doing at that. And if it continues to do this, then I will do X. And you'll express, you'll take a subjective narrative and then you'll express it objectively by adding risk parameters around that. Because that's the only thing you have absolute objective control over is how much risk do I put in that. Now, laid on top of that is a playbook of trades that you're using to express inside of that larger narrative. So, you know, like every day when I, you know, when I look at how the auction closes, I'll build a narrative for the next session. And then I will, you know, I have a number of setups, about eight setups that I have in my playbook that I, that I have hundreds of instances of using that I know how those trades work. And so, you know, inside of this narrative, if the narrative starts to play out as I expected, as the hypothesis was, then I will look to express those, play, those setups in that playbook. And it can be really effective. Now, I'll tell you one, um, I'll give you, give you a concrete example, okay? So um, this morning, the, 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 the narrative for the bonds, was we had this area, this 146.20, which you can see we've, we tagged that uh, post non-farm payrolls. Okay. So, um, I knew, I knew that level before that was where near-term value was. When I mean, near-term value is that's the most traded area of the last five, uh, periods of the last week. So, and I, and I knew that, you know, if I go to a longer term value, it, that price is even much lower. So, so this auction was attempting higher. So, you know, what, what direction is the auction trying to go? It's attempting higher. Well, how good of a job is it doing it? Well, over multiple sessions, as the auction was going higher, it was losing participants. Like even though we had a higher price, uh, higher prices yesterday and a pretty elongated profile yesterday, we actually had negative delta, meaning that they were, there were net sellers while we were moving higher. That's a divergence in that. So that's saying, okay, um, I think if sellers can step in and, and ideally if post non-farm payrolls, we can be below 148.4, then we can go back to 146.20. So that's the narrative. So then I have a playbook trade that I look to express risk on. And the playbook was what I would call a, an IB go with. And that's where I'd look for the IB, you know, the IB to form. So here's the first IB. 
and then I look for the IB extension, which was to the downside. So that's that's a setup. Then I'm looking for a rotation back up into here using the high as my risk to be short for that target. And so if a rotation came before it got up here, I'd be short back to 146.20. It didn't give me the rotation. I didn't take the trade. So, you know, the, the, according to the plan, the auction behaved in the direction I wanted. But when I tried to add the playbook on top of it, the, the setup didn't, didn't arrive. So that's okay. I, you know, I, I dictated, you know, in, in so much in markets we have no control over. What we do can control, again, is our risk and where we choose to express within a narrative that we've controlled. But you have to start with, do I have a narrative on where I believe the auction's gonna go? Which, and that, that requires the skill of these behaviors in the auction. Okay, you know, okay, if the auction's been going higher, well, what's next? Next is there's gonna be some counter behavior that would shut that auction off. We got that today. Typically, there's you know, some kind of you know, pullback that allows you to join that. There just wasn't. So that's, that's how, I, how I think about that. And, and you know, this is the type of work that we do in our pathway is, is to, you know, to describe this. And it's not one of these things that you, just, you can just grasp. It's why we go 16 weeks. And then you know, even with, <laughs> with those 16 weeks, we, we focus on uh, two ways that you can express one setup. Um, get those down and then you start adding to it. Yeah. And there's, and you don't need a lot of setups. And I think that's what Josh is alluding to. The, you, I mean, you can do very well with one or two and let's face it. There's really only four different trades out there in the world, right? Now there's variations of those trades and that's what Josh is talking about. And then the context behind those and how they set up and what you're looking for. If you don't know those, you're just guessing. Okay. You're chasing. You're doing something that, that isn't right and you have no way of identifying your, or like Josh says, the only thing that you can control in all this stuff is your risk. You do that with a stop. And if you can control that, then you, you, know, you have good chances of you know, making a career out of this. And, and the way you do that is obviously what Josh had just mentioned is develop a plan, mm -hmm. playbook. Yep. But first get one, <laughs> get, get one play. That's the place to start and get really good at it, you know? Mm -hmm. I have a bread and butter. I know Josh does as well. And we have a bread and butter. And I would say that, I don't know, what would you say on yours? I have to go back and look. And maybe I will now that I say this. Um, I would say more, probably 75% of what I trade is that bread and butter. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And it why, treats me very well. Why, why go, you know, trying to just, the, the, the myth of activity right? The myth that I have to keep being active. Um, yeah. Will hurt, will hurt you over and over and over in markets. And, and I bet, you know, if, if, if you're, if you've had period of struggle, you continue to have period of struggle. If you go back and, and, and look at what you're doing, you're going to find that you were, you were really active. And a lot of that stems from the fact that you don't know when not to be, you just don't. And so you know, that's, that's a place to work on your development. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes the best trade can be that can be no trade. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, that's a great question. Let me talk a couple next steps for everybody off of this session. So one uh, is to, you know, look at practicing some, you know, selecting some better times for your trades. Uh, you know, we talked about, you know, one is that, you know, after that first hour, let that first hour, because, you know, 97% chance that you're going to exceed that range of that first hour. So let that happen. And then come in to express, you know, an opinion, um, knowing that past that first hour, unless it's a trending situation like we have today, you've pretty much seen the range. Um, so that's going to help you control some risk. Uh, it started with our profile, our, with our pathway. Uh, we offer everybody a one-week trial where you can you can spend a week with us. We we actually have three different calls like this throughout the week where we you know dive in depth and talk about trade setups. We look for trades together um, and, you know, do this every week for 16 weeks, but, you know, want to give you an opportunity to uh, experience that in a trial environment. And if you are on Twitter, you can ch uh, check, search for trade with prof. We're also on Facebook. And then, you know, if you have need any help or have some questions and even want to know, Hey, is this going to be a fit for me? You can send us an email at team at trade with profile.com or give us a call and we'll be happy to follow up with you from there. Well, thank everybody for being with us today. Um, I know we've gone a little bit long, but we had some questions. So as long as we have questions, um, 
we <laughs> we want to uh, to honor that if we have time and we're you know there's no there's no trades today because we're trending higher into the close and um, thank everybody for keep working at it and just encourage you to you know the, we're at the beginning of the year uh, you know the first week now is already over and uh, start looking at okay what's what's my process focus on process focus on approach and um, reach out and get some help if it's uh, it's not working. And yeah, we'll just work. exactly. Just do what you need to do to make it work because you can make it work. Okay, um, you, you're going to find that you need to to do a couple different thing uh, things differently, and and hopefully some of these things will give you some insight into that. And again, feel free to reach out to us. We'll be more than well happy to answer any questions and and go from that. All right, everybody, have a fantastic weekend, and uh, we'll be back next Friday with a um, another session, and uh, we'll see those of you, if some of you jump in with a trial with us, um, we'll see you this week. We'll see you on, on Sunday. Have a good weekend, guys. Happy New Year. Bye.